Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we're going to change gears slightly. Uh, we've been talking about uh, knowledge translation over the last two days. And um, so we have curated this session, keeping in mind that it's very important to have centers at institutions that will help take that knowledge that uh, researchers are generating to the, to the people. And for that, um, uh, you know, bioincubation centers that we have in the country are, have played a very important role. Uh, so I would like to request uh, Dr. Taslim Arif Saeed, uh, CEO of CCAMP. Um, Taslim? Yeah, there you are. Uh, to please lead the discussion, we have with us uh, as panelists Dr. Uh, Asim Mishra. Uh, Asim was also an early career fellow of India Alliance, and he's now the CEO and co-founder at Prante Solutions in Orissa. Uh, Dr. Dipanita Chattopadhyay, uh, she's the chairman and CEO of IKP Knowledge Park, Hyderabad. And we also have with us Dr. Vijay Chandru, uh, Founder Director, Strand Life Sciences. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you to the panelists for coming today. And over to you, Tasleem. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I've been not able to be here, but I have been following the talks through the social media and other aspects. I think that's a great boost for what has happened. But um, thanks, uh, organizers, Shahid, Sarah, and others, to consider uh, this session, which uh, I feel very strongly about, largely. Um, and I have some reasons that uh, make me feel strongly. Uh, as you know, uh, this session is about uh, the translating your discoveries. And I have taken, I don't know whether we are being uh, uh, sure, I've uh, taken liberty to use two, three slides just to set the context. But I also taken liberty, Shahid, to uh, add one word in the given panel title. Uh, it's translating your discoveries in and around uh, incubation centers in and around uh, academic institutions. So, if uh, you know, we have fantastic panel here. Uh, we have, if I may start from right, uh, we have Vijay Vijay Chandru, who has been an academic trend entrepreneur, phenomenal role model, and what he has done. I think the introductions I'll have them introduce themselves. Asim, who has been a fellow himself before, and he has been connected within uh, incubation center, and now full fledged co founder, if I may say so. And of course, the Panvita, who has been spearheading the, uh, the entire phenomena of bioincubation per se. So it is uh, through IKP and so on. But if I may say so, uh, in terms of, and I just heard Sarah say that there has been discussions over a few days over translation. Uh, when we look at it, uh, uh, of course, people talk about that how much percentage of our GDP actually goes in science, right? And people talk about this country does three percent, this country does two percent, we do possibly around 0.75 or 8.8 percent, .8%, if I'm not wrong, uh, of GDP. G3 is suggesting even lower, and it's going down. So while we do that, the, if we do science per se, and even take out the DAE and uh, other funding, even defense funding, uh, the numbers that come around, and there is no co uh, collected number, but the numbers that come around uh, comes around 15,000 crores odd. Uh, it could be 15 to 20,000 crores per year if you take the funding. Now, what happens, and, and this is where I'm coming, what happens with this phenomenal funding? There are two great outcomes that actually come out of this 15,000, 20,000 annually that goes in. One, very, very important, phenomenal scientific training that happens, the human resource that we generate. Very, very exciting thing. I think we train very good scientists at different levels and help them build their career at the next level. And that is, cannot be. It's not trivial. That is phenomenal. And I, I think that gives an edge to us. The second very exciting thing happened is that very, very good science and very, very good knowledge that comes out of it. If I use the yardstick that NASA actually attempts to look at it from the you know, idea to market, because you know, in terms of science, so NASA uses something called technology readiness level. And they say, OK, let's do the journey and give them the 10 steps to it. So it's 0 to 10. And when they look at it, it starts from absolutely an idea generation over possibly a coffee session or in your, 
you know, you know, while you're having a shower, or what are your discussions, to all the way when it is launched in the market for public consumption, if I may say so, and the use and impact. This one to 10. What happens with the funding here, it is my opinion, and it has to be uh, you know, corrected if I'm wrong. We actually produce very, very good science in the technology readiness levels zero to three. That is the early, that starts from idea to proof of concept. It's very, very good. Phenomenal ideas are generated, they have proof of concept, and what we generate, if I may say so, is we generate promise. We generate very, very good promise, which has a potential. And that promise and potential actually has to be taken forward. What we would call it as a translation to actually achieve that promise or a potential. And that is a very important, crucial journey that has to be taken. And I think that is something very, very important. If I may uh, request to use the slides if they're on, uh, I have just intended to you know, depict the same in two to three slides, not more, but uh, this is a broad standard roadmap. I'm, this is nothing new, but I just want to set the context. We start with a scientific idea. We have deep science discoveries that come out of it, which leads to, upon translation work, deep science innovations, which ha then go on to this commercial products. I don't think in this room I need to say that there is, not, there is no point uh, to actually devalue the commercialization because upon commercialization, it reaches actually when it's supposed to reach, that is the public and the societal impact. The next point, if I just say that what is happening is a, and it, it is a global phenomena, a funnel effect when you want to cultivate the science-based innovation where you have very large numbers. I think I would say that India, we need more and more and hence what uh, G2 indicated, we need more funds to have more basic knowledge so that more gets translated and have more industrial applications. The last slide and nothing more, but this is what actually happens. This, if you actually convert the same last two slides which has the same content, it actually, there is a TRL level which I, I'm sorry about the colors that are coming, but if you see what academia generates is a great science, excellent science, the content requires the same thing, but when you talk to industry, what industry wants is the same science in a different form factor. That is a validated, de-risk, further advanced, form of the same science. There is phenomenal understanding the basic knowledge upon which we can build it. And that is something I think we should work on and saying what models can actually use to intervene at that stage and, and go forward. At CCAM, we are attempting to build a model that we have had a pilot. I'll not go into it for now, but we feel very strongly about it. And today's panel allows us to actually have other views in terms of what we attempt to do. So with that context, I think we can uh, let these slides go. I will uh, request my co-panelists to actually introduce uh, themselves um, uh, briefly. Uh, again, the panel has been set to build it, but what we attempt to do is that upon introductions, we possibly talk about the models, the way the translation is being done in and around in academic institutions and what possibly we can do in that model. So if I may request Chandru to actually take on it. Thank you, uh, Taslim, and very happy to be here um, uh, to address uh, all the fellows and other attendees. Um, so, as probably many of you know, uh, Strand Life Sciences uh, uh, was a translational enterprise that came out of the Indian Institute of Science. It was actually the first example in the country of uh, faculty actually you know, stepping out and starting an enterprise. So we were the guinea pigs. We were four <laughs> professors uh, in computer science. Uh, not many people know this, but the Indian Institute of Science was the hotbed of machine learning uh, back in the 90s. Lots of the early developments in machine learning actually came from the Indian Institute of Science, particularly in the Indian context. So we saw an opportunity to come into the life sciences with that expertise in machine learning. And we thought that you know, the fourth paradigm of science was actually starting to affect the life sciences, particularly with projects like the Human Genome Project. And, uh, and so we thought it was time to step out and translate uh, in, in the life sciences. And, um, and of course, uh, uh, as it turned out, uh, I think the, 
the industry in biotechnology, in pharma and biopharma, was not quite ready yet to absorb uh, you know, the kinds of tools that, that we were building. But researchers were. So, so for the first 10, 12 years, all the products and the services that we built was directed towards the research community. And, uh, you know, some of the, the tools that we built actually have resulted in about 25,000 citations so in, in publication. So tools that you might be familiar with, like Gene Spring and Strand AGS, so on, Mass Profiler Pro, all of these came, came from Strand. Um, so, in terms of impact and translational impact, that impact was in research. Um, then it was really interesting that uh, I think we, we took a decision to pivot the company, that's a business term, but essentially to change uh, TAC from being uh, directed towards research to being directed towards clinical diagnostics. And the tools that we had developed actually positioned us to be the first company in India to set up CAP accredited NGS capabilities. So we started doing genome sequencing and so on for clinical applications. And that journey has led us to a point today where we are, I guess, 800 first plus employees, about 40 PhDs in the company. 20 labs around the country. We do about a one and a half million tests a year. So it's actually been a long journey, uh, lots of challenges along the way. I can at least remember three situations where we thought we'd crash and <laughs> burn, but uh, you know, sort of like a phoenix uh, rose from the ashes. But uh, it's, a, it's a complicated process, but um, I, you know, we didn't have incubators, we didn't have any support, essentially from the academic institution. I think that picture has vastly changed, and you will hear more about it. Uh, so I think it's a lot easier today to think about translation and taking it forward, and I think that's my point. Absolutely, thanks. Uh, and I, if I may add, you know, the journey that Chandru has just mentioned, I think uh, many things have been written about it, but uh, I have had a chance to look at it closely even uh, the collaborations that you had with the UCSF based startup 100X, which was a phenomenal thing in terms of, you know, the, the image data analysis and the software to, you know, allow, uh, you know, uh, building things which for research perspective and then your, if I'm not wrong, agilent uh, collaborations uh, and, and now going to personalized medicine all the way, uh, uh, working with, uh, you know, Tresta Labs from the HCG and other collaborations that you have. Actually, the work with uh, UCSF uh, ended up at Institute Curie. Institute Curie, fantastic. Right, for doing all the mi microscopy. Microscopy. Fantastic, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for those inputs. Uh, well, if I may request, Asim, introduce yourself briefly, and uh, you know, what do you like largely to talk about your journey from being a fellow to uh, incubation center turned <laughs> entrepreneur now, so if you can say that. Uh, it's very humbling to be here, especially, you know, <coughs> since being a Welcome Trust first batch early career fellow. Uh, and uh, I very fondly uh, remember those four and a half years of the fellowship because it was way different. You know, the way the alliance runs <coughs> is way different from how any other funding uh, program in the country runs. Uh, so I started the, the company Prante uh, almost just immediately after my fellowship got over and I moved back to my home state, Bhuvneshwar. Uh, very frankly, we ha I had no clue why I started the company and what I really wanted to do in the company. Uh, the first thought uh, or the reason why I started the company because I was a peptide chemist, so I could make peptides and I thought, you know, you could make peptides and sell because nobody does that uh, good synthesis in India. You know, very quickly I realized uh, that's not how it's going to run. Fortunately, I was exposed to one of the programs by IIT Delhi conducted in collaboration with Harvard and SAI. Uh, it was a three-day <coughs> stint, and the first time when uh, 
we got to think about what we could probably do for the company. Okay, and it was a small competition, and the inspiration actually arose from uh, our you know personal experience. Uh, so, uh, I and my wife, who was also my PhD uh, colleague, she um, you know had a, a condition, pregnancy condition, preeclampsia during the pregnancy, and for about four years since then, we were completely devastated and trying to cope up with that. And when the opportunity came, we thought, uh, you know, I think this is the best motivation to do something. And when we started looking at it, we found neither India nor even globally, uh, preeclampsia is addressed the way it should be addressed. There are practically no diagnostics for this, and you really couldn't predict that you are on the verge of entering a complication. And that's how we started this company. Uh, it's been four years, so I was running my uh, parallel academic uh, career post my Welcome Trust, then moved over to the, being a CTO of one of the incubation centers uh, that runs the Bilag Bionist, and uh, had a tremendous experience watching startups, okay, from the very initial stage of idea to you know, what all happens in that space. So, Fortunate for me, I was uh, lucky to have a crash course of early entrepreneurship. Some I learned the hard way by experiencing myself, and some things I learned by watching. So I think that's a unique experience that the incubation ecosystem has uh, brought, into, uh, brought into the country. And four years now, as I stand, I moved full time into the company last month. And we have not only matured from preclampsia being one of the targets that we are pursuing, but evolving platform technologies, simply because if you see in India, there are many companies, but nobody makes devices to a level that international companies have reached. Okay, and not that because we cannot make it, simply because we haven't started doing it yet. So when Taslim shows you the funnel, the hypothesis is you put a lot over the top of the funnel and expect you know, a lot to translate into research. But there's an alternate approach to it. Why don't you just widen the neck of the funnel? So you need a lot more people at that neck who can help translate the exciting research that's happening into products. And that requires a slight change of perspective. Not that entrepreneurship is very different from doing research. It's just a, a new perspective or you need to ask new questions. And if you could do good research, why can't you do, why can't you run a good company? I really don't see lot of difference uh, in the way you look at, uh, you do things there. So that's that's what I have to say. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Asim. So I think if I may take your last point, uh, you know, taking the funnel uh, you know, uh, analogy further, so what you're possibly suggesting is that would the funnel which actually have the neck uh, come in, before that can we actually have a funnel which has two layers in it, or a kind of a, a, a lower layer before, uh, which which could be seen as uh, another next level of playing ground uh, for translation further and not necessarily the same funnel continuing within that you are mixing and you're not going your top, you're coming on bottom and so on. And that's possibly a zone that one, one, could, one could look at. Uh, thanks, Asim. And now I'll go to Dipanvita, who, who ha I, I'm sure has a perspective from a, a completely different where she has looked at uh, science uh, for a few years, uh, where she she has been in the uh, you know model of funding science at the in the entrepreneurship level as an equity model through the India Innovation Fund, if I'm not wrong. Uh, then you have had the IKP uh, and now IKP Eden and so on. And I'm sure you have seen very very exciting academic discoveries going forward in terms of entrepreneurship or licensing and so on. So your views on that depend on that. So uh, I am the chairman and CEO of a research park and incubator in Hyderabad. It's headquartered in Hyderabad. And uh, I say it's an incubator and science park because it also houses large companies as large as DuPont and US Pharmacopoeia, which actually creates an ecosystem. We are not part of an academic setup. We are in Hyderabad, so there are a large number of research institutions and universities. <coughs> but uh, at the time when this was set up, it was set up by ICICI. 
and the government of Andhra Pradesh and then Andhra Pradesh gave us the land at the 200 acre campus. It was discussed that the research that's happening in most academic institutions and uh, Dr. I have to tell you that Dr. Bashelkar was one of the founders of IK, founder directors of IKP, along with uh, Mr. Naranan Vagul, who was the ch then chairman of ICICI, and Ashok Ganguly, who was the chairman of Hindustan Leavers. It was decided that the research that's happening is not translatable and industry will not be able to actually benefit from it. Uh, a new setup needs to be created in India, which is not there. And if we put ourselves in one of the academic institutions, and this came from a CSIR lab, uh, not CSIR lab, DGCSIR, said you should be equidistant from various things because the business culture that has to be built in an ecosystem is not available. And I'm talking of 99, 2000 in any of our research centers. And that's what I hear from Vijay is very similar because even the word business and word commercialization was kind of a taboo. Whether it is now is something we need to ask, but I think we have progressed a lot. And what has happened is because of various uh, schemes like BIRAC coming in, uh, which is a seven year old uh, uh, company, it's a PSC, uh, from the Department of Biotechnology, which helps connect industry and academia through various schemes. And uh, we, IKP, uh, CCAMP, and many other incubators across India, many, and also many, several other incubators across India, are partners, active partners of BIRAC. And I think that itself uh, speaks a lot about the way government has been thinking. It is not like top down, everything being governed from Delhi. It's about how do you partner with various uh, local ecosystems, local bodies to who have the pulse uh, much better uh, of what is happening in the ground and work to see how commercialization can happen. Uh, it's been a fantastic, this is our 20th year. Uh, on an average, I see uh, more than 1,000 proposals coming uh, in a year. So I have probably read about 5,000 proposals, interacted with more than 7,000 academicians, I think 8,000 because uh, we just look at those numbers. These are huge numbers. But I still think there's a lot to be done in kind of understanding what, how commercialization happens. And probably there's a philosophical difference between when a researcher starts working to explore as from inquiry-driven science, inquiry-driven questions, to solutions-driven questions. I think there is a fundamental difference in the way it is thought and how do we structure some of Everyone cannot do and should not do and should not become entrepreneurs. I think we need good scientists, we need science to remain there. But is there a mechanism, and Vijay, you would know it very well, whether what kind of mechanisms, I think we need to develop this. What mechanisms should be put in that when there is something, somebody has to recognize it, acknowledge it, put a pathway for commercialization. Do we have those bodies? And we can discuss this further because I think that the introduction remains short and we can. Absolutely, no, no, thanks Dipan. I think precisely, I think the, uh, ask up, you know, I think once we have set the context and introductions, the idea was to, you know, dive into the challenges that we see uh, and how possibly some of those challenges have overcome in different contexts and geographies and whether those challenges remain the same and whether those require the same solutions or we require different solutions and different mechanisms and different, uh, I think I, idea would be to discuss those today and I think it's, uh, I think it's a good segue for me to get into the second uh, you know, stage of the panel discussion where, uh, so if, if you look at it, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, if you, if you read uh, 
a, a book called Fe Cambridge Phenomena. Um, the author has gone very deep into uh, you know illustrating how a 900 years old uh, university which was doing phenomenal science has changed or rather transformed uh, itself into uh, what you call it as uh, the innovation fountain in, in terms of trans, you know, building those innovations of different sorts and so on without at all compromising on their basic tenet of doing fantastic science and how they have done it. And it is not uh, possibly a solution, but it is a multiple approaches, few approaches gone bunk and few approaches working well. And I think we need to possibly be bold in terms of taking many, many approaches to support science going to the next level. Uh, but I want to start with challenges first and uh, if I keep the same order and uh, start with Chandru, uh, sorry, yeah, I should keep this way. Uh, your thoughts and Chandru, you have seen different geographies yourself, uh, Boston, Bangalore, uh, of course, but what are the challenges traditionally which have been there and where they have come up and let's look at the challenges for now and in India for now, what do you think where it's where, where are those challenges? And then we, next round, we'll come back to possible models, including the role of incubation centers as a next uh, 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 layer of the panel sure. discussion. Yeah. Uh, sure. I think I um, uh, can speak about challenges both from you know, just the perspective of the translational researcher who's then becoming an entrepreneur and so on and also from the perspective of the institution. Right? Uh, so I think from the perspective of uh, the entrepreneur or the translational researcher, I would say that, uh, you know, the, you talked about Cambridge. I think the book by Vyakarnam and Farke is very interesting. Uh, it's called Camels, Tigers, and Unicorns, right? And um, so what I found very interesting in that is the way they've laid out the challenges. And uh, they are actually laid out what they call, call the three chasms, right? Uh, that you have to cross the chasm. However, you pronounce that. Uh, so the first comes up uh, essentially when you are taking an idea to a proof of concept. The second comes up when you have to take the proof of concept to a product or a solution. And the third is, of course, when you're trying to scale uh, product. And, and that at each of those, uh, you know, uh, challenges, uh, <coughs> you need mechanisms to get you past. Right? I think <clears throat> today what has happened is, particularly in the life sciences, you've seen an extraordinary push in getting an idea to a proof of concept. And there's a lot of seed funding available. So that challenge to me seems to have been adequately addressed. Right? And, uh, and the state has played an extraordinary role. Uh, not so much the private capital. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, the private capital, you know, there are a few incubators, but they're really sort of focused on med tech and uh, devices and contact and spaces. Uh, the, uh, the second challenge comes when you, you have your proof of concept and you want to go to a product. And that's where you need uh, early venture capital, risk capital, and so on. And that has not been forthcoming, as far as I can see. Uh, we don't really have adequate risk capital available in the country. Uh, there are some moves to, to create things like the Bharat Innovation Fund and so on, which, which can take you to the next step. But you know, I think the mindset of the, the funds are that uh, they look at a fairly low risk, quick return kind of uh, uh, investments. And, and most of our life science companies not qualified. Yeah. And then the third, uh, you know, is the jump up from venture capital to private equity. 
And for that, you know, you have to have a proven market share, a product that has you know, been accepted by the market, you have enough paying customers, and so on. And the financials are such that there's a large enough market, market opportunity yeah. that private capital yeah. will get in, and private capital will typically look for an exit within three to five years. So, so you really need something that's very, very ready to scale uh, for that, so, yeah. that challenge comes. So now, I think I'll, j I'll yeah. just uh, wrap it up there. No. But, I, but I think you know, these, these are some of the real challenges. Uh, from an institutional point of view, I think uh, you know, the, the challenges that, uh, that we saw were that uh, you know, there was no ecosystem. And I think uh, that, that has changed. I remember when we started Strand, uh, SID and uh, the director who was in Meta at that time said that in the next 10 years, if there are five more companies, we'd be, we'd be quite happy, right, uh, that come out. Uh, today, I, I just checked yesterday with SID, there are 20 translational companies that are currently operating in the campus. And a lot of them, like Pathshot and so on, that Navkan Bhatt and others have developed, are actually doing quite well. And I think these are, uh, so there, there's been a momentum in that direction. <laughs> My final point is that all of us have to be prepared to be camels. If you look at the camels, tigers, and unicorns, we can't be tigers because we can't raise the kind of capital you need to be a tiger. And you can't be unicorns because God knows what that is <laughs> in life sciences. <laughs> I haven't seen, seen <coughs> one yet, uh, other than Theranos. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but so we all have to learn to be camels, learn how to earn also as we, we get started, you know, store some energy to so keep, keep going for the long run. So. Thanks, Vijay. If I may pick, I just wanted to pick on the thought. So, you know, when one looks at uh, the journey of science further, uh, what I would like to add is that there's definitely one, when one talks about commercialization, uh, one, the biggest word that, co you know, joins it is entrepreneurship. Um, but I would like to add to that is that uh, there are other opportunities to take the science forward. Uh, it's not that one needs to possibly become a CEO or a CSO of the company that you form, but there are different forms of taking science further. And I just wanted to add to that discussion uh, that where, you know, you, where there could be an individual, because I think the participants here, our colleagues here, uh, are early career fellows, mid-career fellows, the senior fellows who are leading their groups, uh, leading the fantastic science. Uh, the opportunities are there in entrepreneurship. I think the Parnita clearly mentioned about the funding opportunity, which is there, phenomenal funding. You know, if you want to try your idea, there is a grant available to test. If it works, good, set up your company. If it doesn't work, continue the science that you're doing. I, Many places do not have that. Many, most geographies do not have that. Coming back, but can that be a translation which is not directly linked and not necessarily be uh, an entrepreneurship route, but can be a, you know, taking that from the TRL level three to TRL level seven, where an opportunity for that could be for collaborating with a further a startup, a biotech, or an industry to take it to the next level. Because that is another way where you can actually say, I do want to take this science forward. I definitely am very, very excited on seeing the impact of my science to going to the market, right? Having, a, having impact young children, you know, mothers as you, you talked about, and you know, other people who are impacted with other healthcare, non-healthcare challenges. Uh, how, do, uh, how does that route look like? Like entrepreneurship is very, very exciting because actually you then take the bull by the horns and you actually say, how, how do you want to do that? But here, how does that look like in terms of, uh, you know, when, if, you, if you were not to set up a company, was there a chance for you to do while being in ISC and do that? Oh, yes, uh, there was, right? Uh, so Sorry uh, if it's a curveball or something, <laughs> but please. <laughs> no, in uh, 1994, a bunch of us actually set up the first 3D printing facility <coughs> at ISC. Uh, Guru Murthy, Swami Manohar, and I, we pooled our monies and grant monies and we bought 
a Stratasys 3D printer, and uh, and we used it for uh, printing, you know, various uh, engineering designs, which could then be used to make uh, molds that for manufacturing and so on. And um, so Manor and I worked more on the geometric modeling and uh, you know the computational aspects of 3D printing. And Guru uh, ran the the printing center uh, in the mechanical engineering department. And, uh, and that was the first 3D printing and rapid prototyping facility in the country. And it was, uh, uh, you know, it was a great attraction. Uh, we started getting companies, the automobile companies and so on, uh, showing up at our doorstep saying that they wanted designs to be printed and so on. So we, uh, we were not ready to take it up as, as entrepreneurs. But we, uh, we had a conversation with Tata Consulting Engineers, and they came in and set up uh, an organization called APDAP. And APDAP became sort of uh, an outreach to industry in Bangalore, in and around Bangalore, uh, to actually uh, provide these rapid prototyping services. And, uh, and today, that APDAP has sort of uh, evolved into CPDM at IIC, the, the Center for Product Design Manufacturing, which uh, actually also offers academic programs which are very driven towards uh, translation of designs into, into manufacturing. So, so, you know, that was an experience. From within Strand as well, we did some research that we didn't, we were not ready to take forward. For example, we developed the virtual liver uh, platform, which uh, which could predict uh, hepat hepatotoxicities, both with, uh, with an in vitro and uh, in silico platform, but could give you in vivo sort of predictions. And, uh, but we, to commercialize it, we needed a CRO uh, arm, which we weren't ready to build. So we, uh, we uh, sold the entire uh, patent and the team and, and the lab to, to Sinji. And it now sits inside Sinjin International. So, so you know, sometimes yes. you even do it from within a company. But, uh, no, absolutely. Right. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Asim, uh, you know, when the, the transition for you has been, if I may say so, quick, uh, in terms of you have looked at three forms of, uh, you know, science being done in different flavors of science being done in terms of supported role and so on. Uh, through this transitions, would you be able to identify and possibly share some of the challenges that you see that happens and exist in, in our ecosystem? And if a couple of them you can just mention uh, before we, uh, you know, in terms of that you saw that if this was there, because of this I could move forward or something like that range. Not possibly for you, but in general. Yeah. So uh, I'd probably introduce uh, one of the concepts. So we talked about PRL, okay. technology readiness lab. But when you're talking about something going to commercial, as a commercial technology, there is another scale, which is called as the BRL, which is the business readiness lab. And by default for all deep tech uh, based ventures, uh, BRLs always lag behind the TRLs. So if you are at TRL seven or eight, your BRL would probably be around two or three. Now, uh, my understanding, since I transitioned relatively very quick, as you said, uh, but I was exposed to this idea uh, uh, way ago in 2007 through DBT's first entrepreneurship uh, program, which was the YES competition, which now is uh, best. runs as best every year. And uh, you know, we were exposed to <coughs> the concept of commercial technology way back there when we were PhD students. But trust me, I, I, uh, at that point of time, I never thought I would start a company any day. So uh, let me just introduce this concept uh, very easy, uh, simply. If uh, as an entrepreneur or not as an entrepreneur, maybe simply as an academician, I look forward to a technology being a product where a consumer pays for this product. I need to be on the two boats at the same point of time. While I am trying to push the TRL levels, I also need to look at a compatibility of the BRL levels. 
uh, most often we take the paradigm that uh, <coughs> let's go sequentially, let's reach TRL9 and then we'll worry about BRL. And that's I think is, uh, is, a, is a wrong way to do it. Now, uh, so when, when you kind of go to BRL9, there is a stage you come as the ideation stage, then you come to the prototype stage, and then you come to an advanced prototype stage, and then you some call something as a minimum viable product. The unfortunate uh, scenario is we really do not have clear definitions of what is a prototype, what is an advanced prototype, or what is a minimum viable product. And you know, just like anyone's life, uh, you know, uh, you really can't define uh, what you will be at 40 or what you will be at 25 or what you will be at, uh, you know, 50. So, so we miss looking at the BRLs. And the caveat that you fall in where if you do so is that while journeying to TRL9, you could have spun out some simple technologies which are low-hanging fruits, simple, maybe not phenomenal in commercial sense, but still has few takers. The reason to go in this way is that if you are trying to do good business or really make a technology that has good social impact, because that's what we scientists, even if we turn as businessmen, that's what we are looking for. Then you also need to understand how the business world runs, how the market runs, and how a consumer thinks. And for every stage of the technology, there is a time. Just like uh, you know, we heard yesterday uh, Dr. Bhang saying, the time is a very crucial factor. Sometimes your TRL9 technology is you know, advanced 20 years from now. You know it's good tech. You know it'll survive 20 years. But as of today, there is no one willing to pay a dime for it. So what sense does it make? And maybe 20 years down the line, even though you were the first mover, you had the advantage, you can never capitalize on that advantage. So, uh, you know, the second mover or maybe the third mover or maybe the fourth mover is the one who is actually capitalizing on the tech or the hard work that you built, which was so futuristic. So, uh, my uh, sense or rather the challenge I see is that we need to train ourselves even as researchers while we are doing it to look at TRLs and BRLs at the same point of time and see what comes out of it at various stages. Let's make it sequential, not by the chart, but sequential from the perspective of a product. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. See, if I may just reflect, I think, uh, and we will come back to on the third point, but uh, would that possibly uh, translate into a, a you know, saying that, you know, when you, uh, when a PI builds a lab and wants to take it forward, uh, they actually want to be in an as institution in surroundings which can nurture it more, right? Uh, where it's not about your 200, 300, 400, 500 square feet of lab space with fantastic uh, facilities, but also the surroundings, the people and so on, which can add intangible but you know absolutely invaluable uh, additions to your thinking your thought process to take your science forward when one is building a translation approach does it mean that you actually should also look to engage with an environment which has possibly the mindset and the some of the bearings of this aspect be it with the people who talk about it to actually have that value add rather than continuing. And that, that could be a very interesting model of taking the translation forward. And while we'll come back to it, I had to say it, that incubation centers in and around institutions actually provide that environment to not necessarily only let the science happen in the lab, but also when doing translation, can that be engaged with an environment which can give insights like this? Not TRL to BRL, but also how does it look like, what would industry want, what are the investors want, how does the market look like, because when it goes from a curiosity driven attempt to a solution driven attempt, uh, the, the users actually change and it matters a lot. And who is going to support in your journey to build solution for a user are completely different players and they play on a 
a, a nearby looking soccer field, but different soccer field in terms of the grass, in terms of the other aspects. And that engagement possibly is important and valuable to do that. And I think that model would be also a good model to look at. I'm sorry I had to intervene, but I thought it was a uh, good uh, built into it. Uh, now, you know, while it is important to look at, I, I'll ask the Pavita, in your, and we are continuing, and, but if you can begin with the challenges that you saw, I think you mentioned uh, Dr. Mashelkar uh, indicating that the research is not translatable if, uh, 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 please correct, back. 20 years back, 2000-ish. Uh, have you seen something changing? Uh, what are the current challenges that you still think remain in okay. a broader sense? Uh, yeah, actually the environment is uh, changing. Uh, no environment is static. So it, it is dynamic, it is following where the world is moving. But what happens is typically a researcher, a serious scientist has an urge to share the science and publish, which is absolutely normal and what it should be. Who is going to actually look at, tell the scientist that yes, there is a requirement for this, there is a possibility, what you have done is a unique in some way which can be used and commercialized as a technology or a product, or a product can be built around that. Is there a mechanism in the, or is it, does the onus lie on the scientist? Can a scientist who has been trained in science and not in business, or not even looking at technologies to do so, or should there be uh, other offices like the tech transfer offices that normally exist in uh, most universities and research centers, and capable pe people going through the science and saying, no, this needs to be patented. This should not, this is a know-how that should not be patented or this is okay, please publish. So that mechanism I think one needs to really see how that's developed. So you know, even if I'm talking of large pharma today and uh, I do not know the mix of what kind of life sciences uh, you do, the people in this room do, but if I say drug development. The latest report that I saw says that anyway 90 percent of the candidates that have passed through talks fail in clinical trials. 75 percent of the products that go to the market do not justify the spend on research. That means 25 percent justify. So and that 25 percent gives all the revenues to the pharma companies and by 2020 the net ROI of the net in investment that you expect, the return on the investment that you expect from your research will be zero. If this is from a large venture capital company in the US, it is a Forbes report. Uh, recent report and this is from the large uh, pharma perspective. If that is so, if we do not know what they are doing, what their pathway, what their molecules are, what is their pipeline, even if we are working on something, how would we even think that this is translatable? So where is that interaction, where is that knowledge sharing? Where is that complete grasp of saying what is happening globally? Where is the market moving? And you know, and with a very, very interesting data, and I'm sure you know, all pharma are in largely into deep data now. And there are in <coughs> drug discovery, drug development, globally, there are only 125 companies that are, have raised money, reasonable amount, not significant, no unicorns, significant amounts of money. In healthcare, there are 1,000 and maybe, and must be Strand is one of them. In drug discovery, and actually 
is he is one. AstraZeneca mm. is one of them. So these companies are working extremely seriously on looking at how uh, AI is going to impact and what is it, how will they find that magic pill to crack the stagnation of uh, their pipeline. In this kind of environment, what is the path that our research centers should take and what would be the approach? I somehow feel that yes, the incubators have extremely important role to play. One, because the incubators don't do the science. The incubators follow what's happening and probably connect to the industry and people who are on the other side of it, are interested in seeing the products go into the market. And so there has to be somebody, some element, some sieve, some organizational uh, entity saying that these can be translated, sorry, these cannot be fine, you do the science, but these are the priority areas for an institution to take forward. And uh, well, I've interacted with several, several scientists who say our TTOs are not good. Uh, actually, I, I think it's a national job to first create the right tech transfer professionals and tech transfer offices. Because if we do not have professional tech transfer people in the country who can really do the, do help the scientists, guide the scientists, we will not see uh, the, even if we, in, the increase of your uh, pipe is basically wrapping it around professionals who understand what is to be done uh, from this side of the sieve to the other side of the sieve. And I'll stop at this and. Yeah, okay. no, sure. Thank you. No, th thanks, Ibarat. I think one important aspect, and I think which was being looked at in terms of engagement, and uh, I remember uh, an effort at CSIR called CSIR Tech, mm -hmm. which aimed to build that aspect. Uh, and I think, uh, I think possibly different models of the same are required, and more so, uh, but glued into the organizations, um, uh, you know, with some sort of porosity that we have to build in to do that. Uh, that would be much more because if they remain to be, and this is my opinion, so I'm happy to be corrected and being proven wrong, but uh, if they remain to be uh, the business sides of thing and not the science taking business side of thing, uh, the disconnect actually results into the uh, non-productive outcomes than otherwise. So I think if they more uh, talk the science, which is going to go business side, but rather only business side, that would not this is my opinion on that, my, opinion, my personal opinion. So I think we have heard a few things. I'm very, uh, I'm very of time. We have around 12 minutes or so. Uh, while the third point was being there to bring back on the incubation, but I think we have covered that aspect. And I think we'll let interactions cover that more of it. Uh, but just to give, uh, I think it's very important that uh, I do think and, uh, that this, uh, you know, India Alliance possibly uh, identifies top-notch fellows. I'll not go further than that. I think this is a phenomenal gathering. Uh, uh, and I think it would be fantastic to have a conversation in terms of how to you know, take your discoveries and science forward. And uh, this panel possibly would be able to add some perspectives if you have some questions. So please go ahead and ask questions in no particular order. If I may just, I think if the, uh, the mic is a problem, just shout out and we can build from there. Uh, so I'm looking for some questions before we come. <clears throat> Usha Menon, uh, I want to just take a point that you just made. Uh, 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 take up a point that you made. So you might have a very good tech transfer office even. So just yesterday, I got a paper return saying that because the business office told us not to reveal some coefficients, the paper is good, but they are not willing to publish. Uh, so of course, for the mathematicians in the group, they're like, just reveal it, because uh, the fellow needs to go for the next uh, fellowship. We need that paper out. And I find that's always tension. And whether this will ever become a product 
so far down the line, but the, the, what we can gain by just revealing everything is so tangible uh, that we'll get a high impact paper and that fellow will it'll definitely make a difference to his fellowship application. So I'd like your thoughts on how you do that balance. I would think, and we can uh, debate on this, uh, my personal opinion is it should be left to the scientist. If a scientist feels the urge to take it forward, I think it is the right of the team and the scientists to publish if they think that they do not want to patent. No, no, so it's not about, uh, they, it, they're just trying to decide between, so they want to do this thing. Yeah. They, but they, the they, they're okay on. going the other. There are many scientists who say, even if it is patentable, I do not want to patent. And I think it should be their right to yeah. be able to say so and say, so say I want this as public good. It's so fine. that's a different issue because that's a straight black and white. Yeah. I'm not talking about the black and white because it's really easy to make that decision. Mm. So mm. I'm talking where you can see there's some value down the line. You're right in the beginning. And, but the tangible, it's like eating now. No. and getting fat later, you know, all those so things. So who decides? I think these are all subjective, but if there are professionals who have seen many of these going forward, would be able to take a little more informed decision than so I think this goes back to it. the idea that you need to have a, a, a really professional good tech transfer yeah. office, right? Uh, because these evaluations can be done very quickly if, if you know, if, they, if the right people are there in the tech transfer office. The Harvard Medical School, for example, a couple of my classmates have, from MIT have served as, as the tech transfer officers. And they were PhDs, you know, they've, they've become entrepreneurs, uh, worked in industry, then come back. And they were all, you know, guys who could be, uh, you could go grab them, go have a cup of coffee, sound out and tell them about your research and your paper, and, and they would quickly advise whether or not you could, uh, you know, you should uh, hold back or take it forward. So these are the kinds of, uh, uh, you know, support services that I think yeah, Deepa is, yeah. is talking about when, when you want, uh, you want the, uh, the researchers to, to be able to you know, resolve these boundaries. I think, if I may just add, I think absolutely, and, uh, uh, you know, while those, uh, I think I would say that till that happens, uh, uh, the places where such dialogues happen is a very important aspect as a wild tech transfer offices come up and, absolutely because while they would come up in time and in shape that would work I think the current if let's say if somebody from this group is attempting to do that like uh, so my colleagues on campus from instem one is actually building a fantastic work on uh, you know a cream uh, an ointment which would protect uh, farmers or farming labors uh, from the effect of the pesticides which is you know absolutely toxic uh, and that work uh, it was an easy thing in terms of understand whether there is a market for it whether there is a need for it and then how what how do you plan it like do you, the, if it is a, a know-how or a trademark base, that's a separate thing, but do you want to patent it before you publish? The paper has come out well. I think it has been ranked uh, by, of course, several people, but when Hindu covered the last year's top science being done, it came number one while it was done uh, clearly from the perspective of you know, doing the solution base for the agriculture pesticide-related toxicity. So I think it's I, with tech transfer services, incubation centers, and possibly other uh, aspects, it's engagement, if I may call it. It's an engagement that has to happen more often. And uh, the more you engage with people which possibly talk about other aspects of science taking further. I, I could not put the slides, but uh, you, you know, I, I think there is a fantastic article on uh, accidental discoveries, uh, eight accidental discoveries or innovations which change the world. When uh, the idea was to build this, but during discussions, it could do this, and we know all a lot about that, and that also come out in that aspect. Whether this could work for that as well, and that is the engagement possibly. So, if make I think it's like anything else. It's engagement and exposure. It's it's the key to do that. And if the environment is created by incubation centers, tech transfers, and other things, it's a, that's a boon that it would help. So, uh, I'd like to just put a very small word. What you need to have 
is a person with skills in strategy. It's as simple as that. And a strategist is not a person who has studied strategy. A strategist is a person who can align your desire from you know, whatever tech you are developing, your vision, with everything, every other variable in the, you know, existing in the market at that point of time, the next 10 years, and create a roadmap which you should follow for that one invention. And strategy is, uh, you know, it comes innately to a lot of people. Uh, there are ways to study strategy. Uh, but, you know, when you call as a tech transfer officer, a good tech transfer officer is a person who can design a good strategy for you. Uh, if I can just, sorry, go back to this point of tech transfer officers. How does one train to be a tech transfer officer? How does one build a tech transfer office? Are there any national level programs for this? So from an institutional perspective, if one wants to set this up, how does one go about it? Uh, actually, there's also an association. It's called STEM, S-T-E-M, Society for Technology, and uh, uh, whatever, <laughs> managers. <laughs> so I'm part of it. I'm on the board, but uh, you know, th there are several very well-trained, globally acclaimed officers like Autumn, AUTM. We can get Autumn to do the training. I do not, I think it's the intent and the will that is important. Uh, then, the, the, for example, um, Oxford, Oxford Innovations. They do a fantastic, and it is about learning the process. What, and scientists have to get into this business, and science management is weak in India. And they think, we need to build science managers. So this is also a kind of a, a science management process. And uh, then it's a career. And that has to be done. So and I, I think... Uh, I'll just add possibly, so DBT has a program, if I'm not wrong, yes. uh, which people... Uh, yes, there yes, are, yes. Yeah, yes, possibly. Uh, where they take people to Wisconsin for training for especially for tech transfer and so on for 10 days every year, if I'm not wrong. Uh, there has been an attempt, and I think this needs to be done more possibly uh, to you know, address that aspect. Yeah. Uh, much more. Uh, There's a question from Shah. Uh, uh, very interesting uh, discussion. We've heard some really inspiring case studies, and case studies are always interesting. Um, I'm an epidemiologist, and it always seems to me it's important to get an overview to get the meta picture. And what we know globally is that 90% of tech uh, startups fail. And the problem with failures is that nobody wants to talk about them. But failures are actually uh, a jewel, they're jewels because they help us understand how we should proceed in the future. University tech setups in the US, in the UK, have a similar 90% failure rate. But vice chancellors don't want to talk about the failures. They get buried, and the academics often get buried and have to find jobs in other universities. Um, in the UK, we've uh, invested something like 300 million pounds over the last two or three years in setting up incubation sites in British universities. The first audit of this scheme has just been published, and it shows some really interesting findings. We should have put all the money into Imperial College. They're incredibly successful. Oxford and Cambridge are not far behind. But the other universities have done virtually nothing with the money in terms of return. In exactly the same way as with the pharma companies, the return on the investment is about evens with what comes out. And what I would suggest here is that we've got great opportunities to actually set up systems where we can audit, we can follow up, we can survey, and actually get information of what was started, what finished, what was successful, and learn the lessons. And we've been doing this in the US and the UK for the last two decades, encouraging universities to get involved. And it's taken us 20 years to get to the point where we're beginning to get a grip on what's actually happening. And so, in a, an environment where things are already happening and have been happening for the same 20 years, 
um, we've still not got an Indian survey of startups in biotech in the universities. And it's about time we have the survey so that we can actually get a handle on where we should be going. Uh, couldn't agree more. I think um, about uh, three years, no, four years back, uh, we actually wrote uh, the blueprint for the Atal innovation mission of the Niti Aayog. Uh, a few, about four of us got together and drafted that. And now, at that time, we interviewed all the incubators, uh, the major heads of incubators in the country. And we could, uh, we kept asking for audits. And there were no audits, right? And even to the, this day, the, the numbers put out are you know, the, the amount of money distributed, the number of startups, <laughs> but it's never about, you know, what happened beyond that. And so, in fact, in our report, if you go back and read it, it's on the website, we actually say that don't put money into incubators blindly, right? Because, you know, we are not sure at all of uh, how they perform. Uh, until these audits are, are completed. Uh, and we said emphasize more on grand challenge problems uh, because there you can, you can track much more closely, uh, but that's not how it evolved. <laughs> uh, you know, if you see what, what the Niti just went ahead and did, it was very different. I think Anurag has a question for me. Yeah, uh, partly a question, partly a comment, because you mentioned, for example, that in response to Usha's question, that one must leave it to the scientist in terms of whether they want to commercialize or not. That too gets a bit complicated, especially in institutions like CSR that have a mandate towards commercialization. So in our institute, we are following the policy of CSR in which before a paper goes for publication, do scientists or the institute need to review the paper and say, is there any potentially valuable IP material in the paper? If the answer is yes, it doesn't mean the person cannot publish. It means steps must be taken to file a provisional patent and then move on towards capturing it, the additional money. And then the paper can go ahead. If the answer is no, then there are two people are the signatories to the process that there is no value in the paper. I'm not trying to say it is necessarily the right thing to do, <coughs> but individual goals and institutional goals and national goals are sometimes a bit discordant. And one must be cognizant of that, and not all power sometimes can be directly given, please publish. But the student would certainly like it to be published the fastest possible, so they can move on with their career for a postdoc and so on. But the funders do also have some right over what needs mm. to be done. And in a very, very personal context, I realized this when we had a very nice uh, paper in review on a particular algorithm that by itself was potentially not patentable. It's a mathematical algorithm for judging lung function at the very high sensitivity, maybe 10x compared to current methods. And we effectively almost realized that we're gonna pull that paper out and we have not published it yet, it's been four years, because we competed for one and a half million dollars startup funding from USI tech endowment funds, built our own device along with Rice University spin-off. It's gone for CE certification, should hit the market next year, because the long-term returns of building your own indigenous device with that extra knowledge to give you the edge in the market was worth more than getting that paper out. But you know, sometimes you're in a position where you can make these calls and you, I would not fault anybody who could not make that calls, but institutions need to make a policy which is beyond the individual scientist. So I think you would probably agree with me, but yeah. I still want to see your perspective. Yeah. Only thing one has to, it's not about trusting, it has to be convincing. Uh, so, consensus is built like what, uh, you know, Bala, uh, Dr. Balavanian who sits on a board, Bala keeps saying, Dipanita, either there has to be consensus, either you convince or get convinced. There cannot be that you walk out of the room, so you have to have the power to convince. So, I think that would be Indeed. required. Yeah. Absolutely. I think we have, you know, hit the uh, time buzzer, but I think if I may just say, uh, there is a, a phenomenal opportunity uh, actually being built right in this ecosystem in India. Uh, as Vijay says that when he started out, there were no support system and so on. So while the funding agencies which are being 
on a high alert to support those translation ideas. So while there are entrepreneurship funds, but there are also translation support like CRS that they give, the pays they give, and there are other supports they give for only translation aspect. Um, then there is a, a major, uh, you know, environment of incubation centers are being created. Uh, you know, we at CCAM, we have an incubator, and I think if I may say it from that experience, uh, if there is a lot of knowledge that is being generated, and I think it would be a fantastic idea for CCAM to actually reach out and make that knowledge being available, but also a phenomenal, you know, scientists like you to actually engage with incubation centers like this, because it's absolutely fantastic that what thought process and what discussions go on there which can actually shape what Anurag rightly said, your decision in terms of going forward and not. And I think those processes possibly need to be put in much more so it is not uh, uh, a well-intended uh, you know, uh, environment, but rather process-driven environment so that doesn't, nothing doesn't fall through the crack. Uh, but I think I, I feel very, very optimistic. And I think uh, I'm sure my co-panelists as well, because this is where the science starts. And there is always an importance in terms of, say, taking science to the forward. Not all of it, but there's a lot of it. And I think the more we do it, the more we discuss, the more process we put it, I think the end product will be something that we all will be proud of it. I think with this note, please join me to thank my co-panelists. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Tasleem. And thank you, panelists, uh, for this really interesting and thought-provoking discussion. Uh, with this, we will break for tea, coffee, and uh, request you all to please be back in 15 minutes for the next session. Thank you. <laughs>